Hello, it's me. Weirdly, I'm inside, and even more weirdly, I'm not talking about animals today. Instead, I'm gonna try and show you guys how to do something called a star stack. So, a star stack is something that I'd seen in photography plenty of times, and I kind of always thought it was really complicated, really scary, and something that I could never do myself. But it turns out that's not true. It turns out it's incredibly simple. Now, I'd watched tutorials before, and even when they did it, I kind of thought, blimey, nah, too much, too complicated, don't wanna do it. So what I'm gonna try and do is show you how to do it in the simplest way, in the way that I do it, and fingers crossed, you can get some really nice images. So what is a star trail? A star trail is basically, it's a compounded image of lots and lots of images. Um, the higher the number of images you get, the longer the star trails, the higher resolution the star trails is. So uh, there's a couple of things to bear in mind, but the first thing is obviously you need a camera. Um, the second thing is you need uh, a tripod. And the third thing is you need the software. So if you want to edit your images um, before you stack them, then obviously you'll need to pay for software. But fortunately, there is a really good program um, called Star Stacks, which is free. Um, and that's what I've been using and it works a treat. A star trail is effectively uh, the movement of the stars. And in the Northern Hemisphere, all the stars rotate around Polaris, the North Star. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, they do the same but to the south. So if you want to get you know, concentric circles, um, you need to face north. Um, if you want to have diagonals, you'll face either northeast or northwest. Or if you face directly uh, east or west, you'll get flat, straight vertical lines. This is obviously because the stars are all rotating around Polaris, but at the edges, east and west, um, they are very slightly um, facing Polaris and as you head towards the north they get steeper and steeper and steeper until you get those nice circles. You can do star trails anywhere. There are a couple of rules that you need to bear in mind and that is primarily you need to be in a dark place and it needs to be night time. Um, so if you're going to shoot in the middle of a city you can get star trails but what happens is all the light pollution bounces off the clouds and in the atmosphere and so you don't get a nice clear um, image of the stars. Tonight is not a good night for us to do star trails because it's a full moon but it is beautifully clear so fingers crossed we can get something to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I plan out um, a shoot. We're going to go to somewhere called um, Avington House to photograph tonight which is uh, a really nice subject and a good focal point for the image. So that kind of leads us on to the first point which is when you're planning a shoot yes you can go out and you can just take a star trail but the way to get a really impactful image is to have something in the foreground. Normally, that something has to be really, really still because you're gonna be sitting your camera there for you know half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours, 12 hours. So if your subject moves, it's gonna be blurry. So a building, a rock, a tree on a really still night, um, something like that is great. A sheep, a cow, a person, not so much. First things first, I'm gonna open up this app called PhotoPills. Okay, so PhotoPills is a paid app, but it is really uh, useful. The first thing we're gonna look at is Planner on the top left. So you can see that I've already placed my little pin here. I've placed it where I'm gonna shoot. So you can zoom right in. You can look at the perspective of where you're gonna shoot. So we're gonna photograph Avington House, which is this building here. We're gonna photograph it across the lake um, and so the best place is going to be sat directly in front of this tree. Now when you're looking at the screen you can see that there are three blue lines. The first blue line is where the moon is going to rise. Um, so if we scroll back using the timeline you can see that the moon rose at approximately 10 to 4 this evening and it's going to travel ooh, it's going to travel following this line all the way through to the dark blue line which is where it's going to set, and it's going to set at approximately 9.34 tomorrow morning. So that doesn't bother me too much. The most important thing is I don't want the moon to be in the shot when I'm taking my time lapse or my, um, or my star trail. So if I go back to where I was, at this point we can see that the moon is almost directly overhead of the building. So if I scroll along through my task, through my timeline, I can see that by about eight o'clock, the moon is well clear of the building. So I'm gonna head down there at about eight o'clock and start setting the camera up. 
Star Trails is really useful because it also tells you loads of other information. The first thing you can see when we're looking at this screen is that it's got the, uh, the moon phase. Um, me being the idiot that I am, I'm picking to go on a full moon night where it is at the brightest. But if you want to get good Star Trails or good Astro shots, you go when it's at a no moon or a crescent or just as little light as possible basically. If you scroll through that you can see what time the moon rises, what time the moon sets and what time the sun rises and sets. Um, you can also see the uh, golden hour and the blue hour um, and you can see something called the galactic center. So the galactic center is basically looking through the cross section of the Milky Way. Um, the, the, the Milky Way photos that people often post on things like Instagram, um, you're looking at the galactic center. That's where the huge cluster of stars is. It's a really bright line. Um, on good nights, you can see the galactic center. On bright nights, like tonight, you can see that it will always be invisible. But that doesn't mean that you can't get a star trail. So now that I've got a bit of a plan, um, I know what time I'm going to go, I know where I'm going to stand, I know where I'm going to set my tripod up. Uh, so all that's left to do is have a bit of food and then head out tonight to, uh, to set it up. So I'll show you how to do that. All right, it is night time and I am out and about. It's pretty cold though, it's about minus one or minus two and there's a frost starting to form. So all of my gear is gonna start getting really cold really quick. I've got down to the lake and behind me, you might be able to make out the lights of the house and above it, uh, the moon is pretty bright. And because of that, it's kind of obscuring all of the stars in that area. I made the decision therefore to switch my subject to a very large tree that's directly behind me. And from this angle, that tree faces due north. So what I should get by leaving the camera out here for an hour or so is nice concentric circles around Polaris, which is ideal. So I'll show you how to set up the, your camera. Obviously I'm using a Sony, um, but uh, it's pretty similar with all camera systems nowadays, especially if you've got an inbuilt intervalometer, but I'll show you what I'm doing. In order to do astrophotography, you wanna try and get as much of the scene in as possible to really enhance that idea of drama behind the stars. And so the best thing is to use a nice wide lens. So you could use a 50 mil, um, but to be honest, the wider the better. So today I'm gonna to be using a 14 millimeter f1.8 um, which is ultra wide and probably overkill for something like this, but nonetheless, it's nice and dramatic. Um, generally, as wide as you can get, just steer clear of the telephoto lenses. So, the first things first, if I tilt my light down, you can see this is my camera set up um, on a nice tripod, and in front of me, although you might not be able to see it, is my subject. You can see, this is my scene in front of me. There's the tree directly in front of me, and then a nice composition, and directly behind the tree, or just to the right, is the North Star. Um, and I use that by just using a compass, you can work it out. So the first thing you're gonna do is set your aperture. So you want a nice wide aperture. The wider, the better, but what you'll find is at 1.8, or at the widest extremity, you start to get a bit of distortion in the image. So I tend to crank it back to about two. Uh, in fact, on this one, I'm sat at 2.8. That just gives me a little bit more of a depth of field as well. So once you've set your aperture and you're happy with that, the next thing you're gonna do is manually focus. So for me, I'm gonna manually focus onto the tree itself because normally when you're taking astro shots, you're making sure that uh, the stars are in focus. But in this example, um, the subject is the most important thing and you're gonna have blurry stars anyway, so it doesn't really matter if they're pin sharp or not. The next thing we're gonna look at is the, uh, is the shutter speed. So if you want to have good crisp stars that you can stack on top of each other, you don't wanna have a really long shutter speed. Um, the rule of 500 is 500 divided by your focal length. So for me, it's 14 millimeter. Um, 500 divided by 14 will give you the maximum amount you can hold your shutter open before you start to get distortion. However, what I'm gonna do is just hold it at 15 seconds today. The ISO, I set manually because what you don't want to do, is you don't want the camera to be working out where your ISO should be. You wanna make sure that you're setting that and you're happy with it. You can do a couple of test shots, first of all. So I'm just gonna do a two second timer and do a little test shot. Okay, test shot complete. Let's see what we've got. So we can see that the Subject is nicely exposed and we have got some nice crisp stars in the background as well, which is awesome. 
Okay, so I think we're good to go. Some more modern cameras have got an inbuilt intervalometer, which makes this bit a lot easier. But you can buy uh, an intervalometer off Amazon or anything like that, and they don't cost all that much. An intervalometer basically means that when your camera takes an image, it will wait for a set amount of time, and then it will take another image. Then it will wait, and then it will take another image. And what you can do is you can dial in a load of details like how many images you want it to take, how long you want that rest to be in between each shot, um, and then just kind of set it to do its thing. Makes life a lot easier rather than you having to press the shutter each time. Um, and to be honest, that's what makes this thing so easy because you just set your camera and then you can wander off, which is exactly what I'm gonna do once I've set it up. Okay, so within the Sony system, and this is obviously only for Sony, what you're gonna look for is uh, the, the drive mode, and then you're gonna head over to interval shoot function. So from here, you're gonna turn interval shoot function to on, and you're going to set the starting time is basically how long it's going to take before it starts taking the first image once you press the shutter. The shooting interval, I'm going to set that to five seconds. So once the shutter then closes again, it's going to wait five seconds before it takes the next image. I'm going to ask it to take a thousand shots because to be honest, I'm not going to use a thousand shots, but I want it to be going for as long as possible. And it will give you a rough estimate of how long it's going to take given your current settings. And then once you've done that, that is it. You've done all the hard work. All you need to do now is press the shutter and off we go. This is normally the part in the film where there would be some kind of fancy montage with maybe a drone and some swelling music, but to be honest, I'm just gonna show you how to do this today because it's really cold and I haven't got time. So, um, while that camera is doing its thing, I'm just gonna give you some tips of things that I wish I'd known when I first tried. And the first is, check if you're on a flight path or on a main road or where there's people moving because one of the things that really upsets this whole process is if there's moving light. So yes, we're trying to track the movement of stars but that is a predictable and they're all going the same direction. One of the things that really um, messes up a star trail is when a plane goes straight through the middle of it because then you have to manually remove all of that light movement. Annoyingly, I'm very close to Southampton Airport here, so I'm probably gonna have to do that. But I'm not facing any roads, I'm not facing any houses, so I'm not getting any of those, you know, potential of people moving around or potential of headlights or anything like that. The second thing that I, would, I wish I'd known is to go and check the locations you're gonna shoot before you go and shoot them. Um, before we left Scotland, uh, I wanted to go and photograph these stacks, these great big rock structures um, with the waves and the stars around it, and I thought it was going to look awesome. But I got there, and it turns out that these stacks are at the bottom of like a 50-foot cliff, so I couldn't do it. Instead, I had to work out something else to shoot instead, and uh, I had no idea how to get down to the cliffs, and it was just not ideal. I wish I had known and gone there in the daytime and checked the location and maybe worked out a route to get down to them beforehand. Go and see it, plan your route, look at where you're going to put your tripod, then you can go back at night and it makes everything so much easier. Yeah, I think that's all my good tips, so I'm going to go and warm my fingers up and uh, I don't know, maybe watch Family Guy or something in the car <laughs> while this is doing its thing. Um, so yeah, laters. It's been an hour, in fact it's been just over an hour, um, and it's time to go and collect back the camera. I think it might still be taking some images, so I'm going to stop it early um, and uh, see what we've got. Here's the camera, still going up my big tree. Um, I'm going to just cancel that last one. So you can actually see that on this, on the lens there, you can see that frost is already forming on there. The tripod is uh, <laughs> freezing to the ground. Incidentally, I'm using the Peak Design tripod. Um, I actually really like the Peak Design tripod. It's the travel one, it's really light, it's really versatile. It's not the best for filming wildlife, but for something like this on a nice still day, it works really well. Um, the problem is that it's made of metal, and so my hands are gonna freeze when I carry it back to the car. Okay, so I'm back, uh, and I've taken my SD card out. I'm gonna fire up, capture one, take off all of the photos, and speed up this process, because it's gonna take forever. All of my images are imported. The nice thing about Capture One, and I know it's the same on Lightroom as well, is that you can edit one image and then export all of those changes to all of the other images. So what I'm gonna do here is I've just taken the first one on the stack and I'm just gonna do some global changes. So I'm gonna just bump up the exposure a little bit so that I can get a little bit more of the um, color in the tree itself. Now you can see that over here to the right hand side, 
I've got quite a lot of bright light that's coming through from the moon that is over here basically. So what I'm going to try and do is mask out the sky um, and uh, just bring down the exposure in those areas. Okay. So this is kind of more or less what I'm after. Um, obviously there's a lot of branches within that tree that make it a bit difficult. So if I turn that mask off and I bring in the contrast a little bit. And from here I can just uh, copy and apply all of those changes to the rest of the images. Hello, Future Will here. I realised that I missed out on one quite crucial bit of information that I've now had to go back and redo, and that is to make sure that when you copy and apply all of the settings, you also include the white balance and the colour balance, because as the camera goes through its cycle, that white balance might change by a couple of values. So the white balance will be given a value, a figure. Mine was something like 5152 and what I do is apply that value to all of the images so that the white balance is correct. Anyway, on with the video, thanks. And from here, I can just choose to export um, in a nice high uh, quality. I can export them into the file, the folder that I've already decided and then just uh, set them to export. Okay, so the images have been exported and I've now got them all into one screen. Um, and now comes a bit of the time consuming bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start doing it and then I'll speed it up. Um, but I'm gonna switch to a way that I can see lots of the images all in one go. And what I'm gonna do is scroll through and start looking for those planes. Now if you're lucky, you don't have any planes, but I know that I do. So first things first is I'm gonna go through all of these images and just look for streaks of movement within them and uh, remove them. I've culled through all of those images um, and I've taken down almost 80 images that had planes flying through the shot. So. Not entirely sure how this stack will work, but the next thing we're going to do is fire up Star Stacks, um, which is a free program, and I will put a link to it in the description. So I've brought all the images into Star Stacks. Um, I'm going to use Comet Mode, and I'm going to ask for long trails. This just extends um, the the trails left behind by those uh, by those stars. So all that's left to do here now is hit go and let it do its thing. That's the star stack done, and it actually looks pretty good. So uh, all you need to do once it's done its business is you can play around with the amount of gap filling. Um, most of the time I think it's pretty accurate though, so I'm gonna leave it as is for today. I'm gonna hit the save button, and then uh, call it something like Abington Tree, and then put it on my desktop. Have a look at it. So I'm really happy with how that came out. It's the first time I've done it with a tree in the foreground and luckily because there was no wind, you can see that actually the detail on the trees is quite nice. You can see Polaris in the middle there and uh, yeah, I'm really happy with that. Awesome. Um, I am gonna show you how to do a hyperlapse with the images as well, um, but this video is getting quite long. So if all you wanted to see was just how to do the star trails, that's it, um, finished. Uh, if you want a little bit of extra bits, then Stay there. Hello again. Um, if you are watching this bit of the video, then you're trying to work out how to do a hyperlapse. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, in depth tutorials on how to use Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro or whatever the Adobe version is. Um, if that's something that would be useful, then just let me know and I can try and do some more tutorials in the future. Um, in the meantime though, I'm just gonna show you how to turn your photos into a hyperlapse. It's really easy. Um, 
So I'm using Final Cut Pro. What I've done here is I've created a new project and I've called it Star Trail. I haven't imported the footage or the photos yet. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna do is go to uh, my uh, folder and find all those photos we just took. Okay, so I've now got about 208 images imported into Final Cut. Oh, actually first of all, I'm gonna start a new project. I'm gonna use the highest resolution, call it Abington Tree Hyperlapse. Highest resolution 4K at 25 frames per second, and then hit OK. So my new project is all set up, ready to go. All I need to do now is import all of those photos. So I'm gonna hit Command A, and then hit W, which will import them into the timeline. Once in the timeline, I can hit Command A again to select everything that's in that timeline. Hit Control D, um, which is setting the duration, and I'm gonna set it to 10 milliseconds. Okay, so now I've got all of those images, all 200 and something images, have been condensed down to just eight seconds worth of footage. And by itself, this is the hyperlapse. Now you can see when you're watching this footage that it's quite juddery, and that's because Final Cut hasn't rendered the uh, footage, so the, it's a nice easy fix. So from here I'm going to render the images um, to make sure that Final Cut has got the highest quality beforehand. And then once I've done that I can play around with a little bit of um, camera movement within the hyperlapse. The footage is now rendered out, which means that uh, when I hit play in a second, it should run nice and smoothly. Um, let's have a look. That looks great, I'm really happy with that. Um, you can see those planes moving through the sky though constantly, which is why we had to go through and delete all of that movement. Um, by itself though, you can see the rotation of the stars, it's really nice. Uh, I suppose the only thing that you might want to add is a little bit of camera movement, so all I'm going to do is whack in um, a Ken Burns, just to feel like there's a sense of drawing back from the subject and give it a bit more of a sense of perspective. So to do that, all I'm going to do is select all the images, hit Command G, oops, sorry, Option G, and call it Avington Tree Clip. From here, I can hit uh, we go to the crop tool and hit Ken Burns and I'm just going to switch those two, uh, those two around start nice and close in on my tree and then I'm going to pan out to the whole scene Get done. and that is your hyperlapse clip And that is essentially it. I know that it looks like there's quite a lot of steps, but once you've done it once, it kind of just plays out really simply. This is the first time I've done a, a kind of tutorial, um, but if it was useful, let me know. If you want me to do more stuff like this, then let me know. Um, and if it wasn't useful, then well done for watching 25 minutes of it. Um, so yeah, until next time, bye.